Hey, Ron. How's it going? Good. <laughs> um, so if you're new um, with us today, um, I'll just let you know what we've been doing. Um, we're basically going through all the books of the, the Bible, and now we're on kind of the New Testament, and we're going through the New Testament, and we're just looking at how kind of Christ is revealed in that book, and also how the Gospel is related as well. Um, so we're actually covering quite a bit of content in each message. I mean, last week we went through, if you remember, we went through the book of Hebrews, um, and Hebrews was a book really pointing to Christ as our like, perfect mediator between the sinner and God, and how his sacrifice was that perfect sacrifice for our sins. The old system was basically inadequate um, to make us holy and perfect, and that's why Christ had to come. That's why he had to die, to be that perfect sacrifice. And now today we're looking at one of the Gospels, and this is one of the synoptic Gospels, um, because they're all kind of sharing similar content. Um, but already we've gone through Mark, right? And Mark was written to the Romans, and then we went through Luke, and Luke was written for the Gentiles as well. So today we're looking through Matthew, which is a book written for, who's left? Is the Jews. And so today, Matthew, it's a book written um, to share the gospel to the Jews. And so the title of this book, um, it bears the author's name. The author is Matthew. He's also known as Levi. That's his name that comes out in actually the gospel of Luke. Um, but Matthew, he's one of the 12 apostles of Christ. So he was there with him. Um, and, you know, one of the questions you might be having is, you know, actually, we've been going through these books in chronological order of when they were written, right? And so you're like, wow, this, this book of Matthew, it's kind of written kind of late, right? Um, and that's true. I mean, the author, Matthew, he wrote this kind of late. Um, but the reason for that is quite simple. For the longest time, the Gospels and this Gospel is just passed as oral tradition. In fact, for 40 years, it was just passed along orally. And part of the reason is, if you can imagine this early church, they thought the end, the return of Christ, was imminent, that it was coming very soon. So it actually didn't really have a need to be written down. Um, but then there's also the other reason of, you know, there weren't printing presses, you know, if you're going to write down the letter, it had to be copied and sent out. So... You know, for the past 40 years, it's just oral tradition, but, you know, coming to kind of the end of Matthew's life, it seemed right to record this and leave it behind um, as kind of a memorial, right? In the same way Peter did that. So when he saw his death was coming, he wrote a letter of evidence kind of proving who Jesus was as a memorial. And so that's kind of what this is as well. So once again, Matthew, um, being a Jew himself, he's writing to the Jews as well. And his purpose in this book is to show that Jesus is the promised Messiah and King. And this isn't something that he's just kind of hoping for or wanting. Um, he's actually basing this in evidence. And it's the evidence of Scripture. So if you look through Matthew, he's always looking at the prophecies of the Old Testament and how they are fulfilled through the coming Jesus, who is the Christ. And so if you think about this book, Matthew, it's basically a bridge because it connects the Old Testament prophecies and scriptures to the New Testament, which is basically showing the fulfillment of Christ. And that is the reason why it's found as the first book of the New Testament, because it acts as that bridge. And kind of also, kind of one other unique thing about Matthew, um, a lot of times it's going to be saying, instead of the kingdom of God, Matthew ends up using the kingdom of heaven. It means the same thing, um, but some people think maybe out of reverence for the name of God. When he's speaking to different people, he just uses the word heaven instead of God. But as we go through this, I'll kind of use them interchangeably. Heaven and the kingdom of God. And also, of course, Christ, Messiah. Right? Those are also meaning the same thing. Christ is Christos, the Greek word. Messiah, the Hebrew word for the anointed one. So I'll kind of be using these things interchangeably throughout the message. Um, but before looking at the message, um, you know, I want to look at this author, Matthew. And kind of what we see, even within Matthew, is he shares his own calling within this book. And so looking at Matthew 9, we have the calling of Matthew. 
It says, as Jesus went on from there, this is in Matthew 9, verse 9, it says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And I share this right at the start because I think it's important to understand the author. And even it's amazing to see his response to the calling. Right? What is his initial response to when he's called by Jesus? It's immediate. Right? He doesn't question it. He doesn't think too long on it. He immediately follows. No hesitations, no preparations were made. He simply follows Jesus. And I think about this, and I realize this is the way it is with God. When God calls us, that is like an irresistible call. Right? We cannot deny it. It's kind of what our souls have been longing for for so long. And when He calls us, we have no choice but to respond. And in our heart, it's the same way. It's an immediate response. And also we see, of course, as he's leaving his past life, as a tax collector, as a sinner, right? he's coming basically and turning from the life of sin and turning to God. Also, something else we see just from his calling is, it's kind of remarkable, but what does he do right after he's called? He throws a feast. Right? He throws a feast, his friends and all these other tax collectors, sinners come. Right? And he does this because he wants to share the joy of being saved with them. But I think it's cool. With that, he's also basically being a witness. And he's basically, Jesus is there. And they're going through the gospel, right? So you see someone that was called, he responds immediately. He wants to be a witness to his friends because of that joy that's overflowing. And kind of the last thing that he does is he leaves this book behind. He wrote Matthew, the Gospel. And that shows he's not just interested in his life and his generation and saving himself, but he also has the heart to save the next generations and those that come after him. Right? This is kind of leaving something behind for the next generation. And that's something that I encourage you guys all to do as well. Don't just think about yourself and your own generation, but think about what is something I can leave behind. Something of faith that I can relay to the next generation. Because that's exactly what Matthew does. So now with this given, we see you know, this tax collector, this sinner, he really knows the value of Christ, and he wants us to enter into that relationship as well. So thus he writes the Gospel. And he does this in a very organized way. And he puts it together very organized to show that this is the Messiah prophesied to come, and this is the true King that would bring his kingdom here to earth. And so this is what we need to kind of understand as we enter into this Gospel. So the first point we're looking at today is Jesus the Messiah. And this is mainly shown through Old Testament fulfillment. So Jesus came as the Savior of the world because ultimately we are spiritually enslaved to sin and Satan. So Jesus came as the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ, to restore what was lost. Our relationship to God and also this fallen world. And so we see Matthew, he begins his book with a very long genealogy. Right? And I'm sure you kind of read through it, maybe you kind of skim over this, or read over it, you're like, oh, it's just a bunch of names, what's the importance of this, right? Um, and me too, <laughs> that's the way I would be too. But there is significance within this. It's very important, actually. Um, this is a part of Matthew's plan to give evidence of who Jesus is as the Messiah. He's to show that Jesus, one, he's a Jew, He's from the line of Abraham and also the line of David. And this is very important because Jesus is fulfilling the, Abraham, the, the covenant of Abraham and the covenant of David. So if you guys don't know what those are, 
Um, in Genesis 12, verses 1 and 3, this is when Abraham is called. That's the um, covenant of Abraham. And I'll just read it really quick. It says, The Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. This is fulfilled through the work of Christ. Those that are in Christ are ultimately brought into this covenant, into this blessing of being God's family. And this promised land that he's saying, this land I'm going to show you, this is ultimately supposed to be a picture of heaven for us. A place of true rest that can only be found with God. But then also this Davidic covenant he came to fulfill as well. And this is found in 1 Chronicles 17, verses 11 to 14. It says, When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from him who is before you, but I will confirm him in my house and in my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. This also shows that this Messiah would also be a king, a king of a new kingdom that would be established forever. He would be this Messiah king, and it would be a kingdom he would rule over all eternity. So Matthew ends this genealogy in verse 16, saying, And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. And he's just showing it right there. Hey, I'm going to write this book to show you who the Messiah is, right? So besides these covenants that he's fulfilling through kind of being born through that genealogy, that line, we see there's lots of um, scripture that he fulfills as the Messiah. I mean, right from the start, um, his virgin birth, Right? Fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. It even adds that. In chapter 1, verse 21, she will give birth to a son, is where I call him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Right? Fulfillment of Scripture. You know, even his calling out of Egypt. That was fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. His birthplace in Bethlehem. This was fulfilling prophecy. Even the gifts from the Magi. This is something unique to Matthew. But this is also to present Jesus as this Messiah, as this King. His childhood in Nazareth of Galilee. This is to fulfill prophecy that the Messiah would be called a Nazarene. Right? It's all scripture being fulfilled. And this is just the first chapter, the first actually two chapters. But Matthew, throughout the entire book, he's always going to be pointing to the birth, the life of Jesus, as the fulfillment of God's word. In fact, Matthew, he's known to frequent, frequently use this phrase, that which was spoken through, the prophets might be fulfilled. It's repeated again and again. Why? Because Christ is the fulfillment of Scripture. Jesus fulfills this. So because Matthew is showing that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied through his birth, life, and death, we see that in the course of Matthew, there's actually 60 direct quotes from the Old Testament and more than 60 allusions from the Old Testament that are giving evidence to this truth. So it's kind of cool. Matthew is actually a book of evidence. And this is a challenge, especially to the Jews that are going to be reading this. Um, because one of the things that is difficult for them is they actually have an expectation regarding the Messiah. They have something already imagined of how he would be um, and so this is going to be a challenge because most people they thought that the Messiah would come and he would come in power 
and he would come kind of as a leader of a revolt to free the Jews from Roman occupation. That's what kind of they were waiting for. To establish a new nation, and he would kind of sit on that throne. And this is what actually previous Messiah figures would be, and later Messiah figures that would come, they'd be starting these revolts, they'd eventually be killed, but they were always trying to lead the people out of oppression. And this isn't what Jesus was doing, right? What was Jesus doing? He was going around, you know, healing people, teaching people. But they were looking for this physical liberation. That's what caught them. But Jesus, he came to liberate them spiritually. What they didn't see with their eyes was the spiritual freedom that was coming to the people. All of Jesus' miracles, the power, they were ultimately to demonstrate that He is the Anointed One, the Christ that was sent from God. And we see that even within the, within the miracles that He was doing, they were still confused about things. Um, some people just thought He was another prophet or a teacher. So after doing ministry a while, He gets this crowd that begins to follow Him. And we kind of see the climax of all this stuff, all the scriptures being fulfilled, kind of all these works in Matthew 16. And this is a very popular verse, right, for us? Matthew 16, 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the moment when even for the reader, back then, when this was written, after going through the evidence of the Old Testament, they might have been seeing you know, all the scripture and after seeing all the healing, all the works, they, would, might, they might be seeing how they too were mistaken. Right? They had this misconception. They might have heard the stories, but they didn't know the facts. And so now it's presented to them, all this evidence. And now, they can see, maybe Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. And I think this mistake that they made is still being made today. If you look at the Jews today, they are still waiting for the Messiah. They're still waiting to this day. They're like, oh, he never came. He hasn't come. And so they're still continuing on with their same Old Testament kind of system. Actually, the system that came out of Babylon. Um, a very religious system, which is based on the law. And even regarding, you know, people today that are Christians, we are very Christian. Some people, they're also blind to this truth as well. Right? They see Jesus as kind of a good model, a miracle worker that could kind of grant them what they desire, um, or someone just kind of doing a social justice movement. I mean, a lot of Christians that are like that. That are like, oh, if you're not behind this social justice movement, you're not even a pastor. You know, you're not even a Christian. It's kind of crazy. And the reason is they're so caught up in their own image of who Jesus is. They're blind to the revelation of God. And that's where it's got to come, actually. It's by grace. Even for Peter, it was revealed to him by his Father in heaven. And that's what we really need, is that grace. So after making this confession, <coughs> we see even the disciples, they were still kind of caught up in their expectations of the Messiah. You know, he shares, Jesus shares right after this, that he would die. Now how could this be? He was going to, you know, free them from their oppressors, free them from Rome. You know, how could Jesus do such a thing? He was freeing them ultimately from spiritual oppression and slavery to Satan. And his way was the cross. But they couldn't understand that. And so after he shares that he's going to suffer and die, it's not what they wanted to hear. And even Peter, right away, chapter 16, verse 22, he says, You know, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Right? He couldn't believe that Jesus was going to die. Jesus turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely the concerns or the human concerns. 
And this is something that we have to understand. You know, this liberation that Jesus came to give us is liberation from Satan, the ruler of the kingdom of air. And what, what Peter was thinking about and focused on was just this physical liberation and also just national liberation, actually, just focused on their people. But Christ came ultimately for all people, especially his people, to be saved and liberated. And this is accomplished through the cross. That's why it was necessary for him to die, to fulfill this work as the Messiah in fulfillment of scriptures and liberate us. The second point I want to look at is Jesus the King. And this is kind of looking at his kingdom that he was going to establish. Um, and because, you know, Jesus is king, we need to understand, what is he actually the king of? What is his kingdom life? Because it's a very different type of kingdom than we know. And Jesus ultimately has to correct the people's understanding of what God really intends for them and this world. And it's basically looking at this kingdom, and he's going to bring this kingdom here to earth. And so we see Jesus as the king. He's going to be teaching about his kingdom throughout Matthew. And there's a lot of obstacles that he comes across. And so one of the parts where he's actually teaching about the kingdom, it actually comes through this Sermon on the Mount. And this is kind of unique in Matthew in that it's all kind of put together as just one big group of teachings. But looking at the Sermon of the Mount, a lot of people, um, they see this as kind of the king's inaugural speech. Right? That he's coming into his throne. Like this is kind of the start. This is how it's going to be for his kingdom. And this is actually found in Matthew 5 to 7, if you want to look there. Um, but Jesus, he's going to compare kind of their understanding of things with, you know, and their current kingdom and the world with kind of the kingdom of God. And so a lot of people, they have different interpretations on this. Um, but I'm just going to kind of look at it in this kind of reference. And I see that Jesus, he's ultimately trying to correct their understanding in four different areas. Um, and those are regarding the people of God, the law, the heart and kind of motives of mankind, and finally, the way to enter heaven. So firstly, looking at the people of God. So Jesus, he's going to start by going through the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. That's very famous, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that mourn. Blessed are those that hunger for righteousness. The merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, the persecuted. Right? Everyone kind of knows this, right? But the Beatitudes, they confront a commonly held belief that those blessed with comforts, that those without problems, are the people of God. Because this was kind of the thinking of the time. If you're blessed with comforts, without any problems, you know, you're blessed by God. You're His people. And this ultimately led to a generation that was led kind of by their own self-righteousness, by their own pride. They kind of reveled in their comfort, their wealth, their recognition as being chosen by God or blessed by God. And so if you were kind of on the opposite side of this, if you might have struggled with your faith or struggled with sin or had problems or suffered or were persecuted, if you were an outcast of society, you know, that would mean you were cursed by God normally. So he kind of flips the tables on them, saying these are the ones that are truly blessed. And he also shares that these are the ones that are going to be actually witnesses of the new kingdom. So he talks about them as the salt and the light of the world. And then he looks at the law, because they had a lot of misunderstandings regarding the law. He's basically saying that he himself is the fulfillment of the law. They thought that the law was their way of salvation, but it actually raises the standard for them to see that that's actually impossible. The law is not going to save you. It actually says in verse 20, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. The standard is so high now. He's basically saying the law is not going to save you. But that's why you need Christ. That's why I came, to fulfill it. And then he continues pointing out their errors regarding other things regarding the law. 
And he does this kind of by, by looking at each section and saying, you have heard it said. Whenever he talks about these laws, he said, you have heard it said, because there's a commonly held belief. So regarding murder and adultery. Regarding murder and adultery, they looked at just the outside. Jesus is actually pointing to the inside. Murder and adultery, that's just something you look at as actions, but there's a root problem regarding that. It's a problem of sin in the heart. Regarding divorce and oaths that people were making, people were trying to bypass the law, finding loopholes. It's basically their way of avoiding trying to live up to that standard. It talks about, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You guys know where that comes from, actually? It's actually from 2,000 years before Jesus. It's actually from the code of Hammurabi. I can't always pronounce the name. Um, Hammurabi, he was a king of Babylon, actually. And this was, you know, he was kind of known for his code of laws um, in like this 1700 BC. Um, but that's where that actually comes from. It was just kind of the common law that other nations were using, everyone was using. He also talks about um, loving your neighbor and hating your enemy. And this goes back to the question of who is your neighbor? Because that's kind of how we define things, right? With borders, with lines. Those within our borders are our neighbors, right? And so everyone else is the enemy. But of course, this is in God's way. He's the creator of all the earth, all nations, right? God's people are from all nations, from all different people. And then he looks at kind of the motives of their heart to kind of examine that a little bit. Because even the righteous actions that they were doing, they were not out of a heart to serve God, ultimately, but to serve themselves. And this goes back to what Isaiah says, you know, all of your righteous acts they're like dirty rags. The people, they present themselves as holy. They present themselves as righteous for the sake of their own glory and praise. And so he speaks to seeking recognition from people versus really seeking recognition from God. So he talks about things like giving to the needy, about prayer, about fasting. Are you doing these things for people to see or for God? And then he also confronts the things that really capture our heart. Things like money. You know, where's your treasure? Is it here? Which master are you serving? He confronts our worries. Because worries, they ultimately stem from a heart that doesn't really trust God. Doesn't really trust that he's sovereign. And regarding judging others. Because usually that judgment comes from a heart of pride that looks down on others, and it kind of consumes our hearts. And then in Matthew 7, he begins looking at heaven and how we enter it. Ask, seek, knock. Right? Basically, if you seek the kingdom of God, the way of salvation will be opened. Narrow is the gate. Right? It's the unique path of Christ, and many don't find it. But there's also obstacles to that. False prophets, false disciples. These are obstacles, people are, that just are religious. And he kind of ends this time of, of the Sermon of the Mount by sharing the parable of the wise and foolish builders. Because it's not only important to hear the word, but of course apply the word to our lives. So that was kind of his inaugural speech regarding the kingdom and how it would be and how it should be and kind of misunderstandings of things. And then we see he's going to start bringing that kingdom here to earth in power. And we see in Matthew 12, you know, he begins healing people. He begins casting out demons. Basically bringing the kingdom of heaven here to earth with authority. He commissions out the 12 disciples to go and do the same, giving them authority and power. So the image that we're supposed to have in our heads as we kind of come to this point is this image of two kingdoms, right? We have the kingdom ruled by Satan, of darkness where people are suffering in their sin, trapped in problems, versus this kingdom of heaven that he's bringing, of healing, of life, of restoration. And we see in Matthew 12, 25, after he does a healing, they actually think it's by demons he's doing it. So he says, 
Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your people drive them out? So then, they will be your judges. But, and verse 28 is the important one, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Wherever God's Spirit goes, wherever God's Spirit comes, the kingdom of God is being established. So what does that mean for us here today? Right? Do you have God's Spirit with you? Right? If you have God's Spirit with you, that means the kingdom of God is being established right here. Right? This is the kingdom of God, wherever God's Spirit is. That's such a blessing. That also means wherever you go, you're bringing the kingdom of God with you. Right? Wherever the gospel goes, wherever someone's saved, the kingdom of God is being established. I think that's an amazing thing. So after Matthew 12 and Matthew 13, he actually shares some parables about the kingdom of God, and kind of it's kind of looking at the church by now as well. So he shares these parables, parable of the sower, the weeds. You know, the parable of the sower, we kind of know that that's about the word of God and how it really needs to enter into someone uh, for them to have salvation and to be nurtured in it as well. The parable of the weeds, that's looking at the kingdom of God, but the church, rather, and how even within the church we have those that are saved and those that are not saved. Right? It's a mix. The mustard cheese... The mustard seed is showing how the kingdom of God grows, right? I mean, just, just think about it. How did the early church start? It's just 120 people praying, right? And the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came, and whoosh, we're heading out to world evangelization, right? Look how much it's grown. Then he shares about the treasures in the field, so we know the value of Christ more than anything the world can offer. And then the parable of the fishing net. We're still looking at, of course, judgment will come in the end. We need to be aware. Kind of the point of the Sermon on the Mount, the point of the sermons, the healings, uh, the miracles, the parables, this is all to, for people to see that the kingdom of God is coming. For them to understand it and see it's coming. And it's because the state of the world that we live in. This world is driven by the opposite things. This world is driven ultimately by Satan leading us, but by selfishness, by riches, by wealth, by success, trying to make a name for ourselves. There's fighting, trying to compete and conquer others. This is the kingdom ruled by Satan. But Jesus, he's pointing us to the kingdom that God desires. He's pointing us to the kingdom that He will establish and that He will be king of. The third point today is looking at the truth that is finally revealed and the way that's opened. So after kind of these teaching and things, we see that Jesus, He's going to have some confrontations, right? Um, he has a confrontation at the temple because they basically made it into a den of robbers. Right? It's basically a marketplace. And he drives them out. He has confrontations with the Pharisees, with the rulers of the time. And so we reach this point where Jesus is ultimately arrested. And he's put on trial. And it's during this time when we actually see the truth is revealed within his own words. So first the trial um, with the Sanhedrin. So he's put on trial with the Jewish council in Matthew 26, verse 62. Matthew 26, 62. It says, Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. 
But I say to all of you, from now on, you'll see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. So first we see, he just admits that he is the Messiah, but then he shares this other kind of phrase, this other scripture. If you guys don't know, this scripture, the Jewish council, they, they know right away what he's talking about. This is from Daniel. It's from Daniel 7. And this is a prophecy regarding the Messiah as well, the Son of God. It's found in Daniel 7, verses 13 to 14, and I'll just read it for us. But in Daniel 7, it says, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, which is God, and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is the one that will never be destroyed. And there's no doubt that Jesus is claiming to be the Messiah, and he's also claiming to be the eternal king that will reign forever, whose kingdom will never be destroyed. And we see this again when he's on trial with Pilate. This is the Roman governor. In Matthew 27, verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. And then in verse 27, we see, The governor's soldiers took him into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, then they knelt in front of him and mocked him, Hail the King of the Jews. Above his head they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Of course Jesus is the King of Jews. But put another way, he's actually king of God's people, the true Israelites, the true Jews, and the kingdom of God. When we see the ruler of this kingdom, Satan, he would ultimately have his way. He would lead the people to follow him, and they would lead the people ultimately to Jesus being crucified on the cross. But ironically, what Satan thought was going to be his victory ultimately became his downfall. The death of Jesus is actually the way that he saves us. And it's not the physical Jews we're talking about, but us as God's people. The people of the covenant, they would be saved from sin, from Satan, because he would destroy the work of the devil. He is the king that is victorious through the cross. And his sacrifice is the way that opened it. His death on the cross is the gateway for the kingdom of God to come here on earth. And Jesus had been speaking of it, and now it was opened. So in conclusion, just looking back at Matthew, um, honestly, Matthew, it's really hard for me to give a message on, um, because there's so much. And I could have spent like, you know, I think in the past we actually spent a year going through this book. Um, I do it in one book. I can't cover everything. I can't even touch it. I mean, even if I, I just, I was like, oh, maybe I should just go through just the outline of what happens. But then there's no message there, right? It was very conflicting for me. But it's important for you just to understand the basics for you guys to read it later. And that's always my hope when I give these messages. You know, don't just listen to it, but take this understanding of kind of the framework of things and read God's Word and apply it to your life as Jesus instructs, right? It's very important. Um, so we see through Matthew, Matthew is ultimately this bridge, right? From the Old Testament to the New Testament, proving from Scripture that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is both Christ and the true King, and He came to bring this kingdom here to us. He shared this picture of heaven to the people and he began bringing it through his healing power and work of the Holy Spirit. And finally, through his death on the cross, he opened up the way to God. 
And after his resurrection, this is when he empowers all of his followers, all of his disciples, to be witnesses of this. And so finally we have the Great Commission in Matthew 28. And this is the passage we read at the very start today. Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had let them go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, because he's the king. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus ends by sending us out as the ambassadors of this kingdom. And it's with the authority of the King, of Christ. He gives us authority, and He always says this. He says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the work that He's going to do as the King, even working through us. So now the question is, is the kingdom of God here? The answer is <laughs> yes and no. Right? Why? It began when Christ came. So the kingdom of God, it's here. It began. And the Holy Spirit is continuing that work. As we share the gospel, the kingdom of God is coming more and more. That's why we're living as witnesses of that kingdom. And it's ultimately not our power, but the power of God. So that's why we shine the light wherever we go and every step we take. But the thing is, when everyone has heard the good news, all peoples, every tribe, every nation, and they've all had a chance to hear the gospel, that is when Christ will return, and that is when the full kingdom will be established. And that's the covenant we're holding on to. We are in the process of the kingdom coming. And when Christ returns, that's the day it will be established. But until then, remember, I am with you always to the very end of the age, that God is with you. So I pray that this week you can truly enjoy Emmanuel each and every day, that God is with you, and hold on to this covenant that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, and He is the King. And he has all authority and power. And that Christ, that King is with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray.